Good morning, everyone. Please, I'm sorry, my I don't really know what's happening. I really have poor internet connectivity here, so I don't know if probably we should be having the meetings in the evenings or something. What do you suggest? Because this internet is really worrying me. The connectivity in my area is very, very, very poor. So I want you to suggest something so that I, I know what to do. You can raise your hand. Okay, so I'm okay. Listening. How about 8 p.m. to 9 p.m.? That's fine with me. I'm okay. Me, I'm here to help everyone. So if it's going to be favorable for everyone, why not? Because I think that during the day, there's a lot of pressure on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So if we could, we schedule it to evenings, and then we could have um, probably a serene time with, in class would be better because this up and down, this um, cutting in and interrupting really destroys the class. So I've like saying eight to um, nine. Can I hear more suggestions so that probably we can have today's class if um, there's an error again, we just take it to um, this evening. Please, I want to hear everyone talk. So it's about you, okay? And I'm here to help. So kindly let me know. What do you think? Okay, so it means I, I can actually go ahead. If there are no more suggestions or anything, let me just quickly go ahead and then continue. But should there be any interruption, we'll have to reschedule the class. Okay, Gershon is also saying that 8 to 9 p.m. is cool. Okay, so let's try and have today's class. And then if there are no more interruptions, you can start the 8 to 10 class probably from tomorrow. We will also try that one and see. So if it works, then we just go for the one that works. Okay, so I hope everyone is okay. And then we can begin with today's um, class. Okay, so Habib is also saying 8 to 9 is cool. Sefa is also saying, okay, so almost everyone here agrees with 8 to 9. Okay, so what we are going to do is that we are going to have today's class like the normal 10 to 11, 11, 15. Okay, but then if, if the internet gets interrupted, we just have to reschedule this class to evening, 8 to 9. But let's just pray that the internet is not interrupted so that we can actually start tomorrow's class from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. All right. So yesterday, I want to um, go over what we did yesterday because it's actually a continuation of yesterday's class. So yesterday, we started learning about the basics of bookkeeping. And then we learned that bookkeeping is actually the recording of transactions in our business. So every time we record transactions, we're actually doing bookkeeping. But then there's a way in which we do bookkeeping. It's not only about writing, writing the transactions. When you write the transactions, you need to assign all transactions to an account. That's where the general entries come in. So after writing your or recording your transactions, then you will assign an account to the transactions in your general entry. Yesterday I showed you how a journal looks like. When we are done with that, then we go ahead to post in our leisure. So with the leisure, we have various individual accounts. Okay, so we have the cash account, we have the sales account, we have the account receivable, that's money that our customers owe us. Then we have the account payables, we have the money that we owe our client. We have furniture accounts, we have rent, we have wages. So any form of account based on the transactions that happen in our organization. Okay, yes. So that is it. So today I'm going to look at the other tools of bookkeeping. So yesterday we learned about general entry and then posting to ledger account as one of as two of the tools of bookkeeping. Today we are actually going to learn about we're going to learn about the other two that is trial balance and then chart of account. I'm going to make it very, very simple for everyone to understand. As I always say, if you have questions, kindly let me know so that we can um, solve your issues and then we can move on. So as I always do, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen with you. 
so that we can move on with today's lecture. All right. But I believe we all understand. And then I would have loved to ask questions, but when I ask questions, no one responds. So I don't know. I'll we'll have to hear from everyone. Anyway, let's move on. All right. And then I want to add, please, if you have any challenges with your assignments, you can reach out to me privately and then let me know. Okay, if you are having any challenges with your assignments, you can reach out to me for any form of assistance and then let me know. So what I'm planning to do is that when you submit the assignment, then I help you work on it. Okay, so if there are any errors, I correct them for you, then I send it back to you so that at least you know how it is done. Uh-huh, okay. All right, so I'll send your individual feedbacks to you. I won't put them on the page, no, I'll send it to you and then <laughs> you know. All right, great. Hey, <laughs> someone is laughing. All right, so let's continue. So as I said yesterday, we learned so many things yesterday. We learned about bookkeeping, double entry principle. Okay, so yesterday, um, we learned about bookkeeping, the double entry principle, but we said that for every credit entry, there's a debit entry. So based on a transaction, let's say sales to a customer, you can't say that you're only going to record just one side, one entry. No, it has to be two. Every transaction has more than two accounts, at least more, at least two accounts. Uh -huh. So there's no way you record a transaction and then you're only going to record just one. Let's say you bought item, then you just record at your cash side, no. You need to create two accounts. That's your cash account. And then the item that you bought, you can either and label it supplies or probably if it has a name and there are things that you are actually going to be buying for your organization, let's say furniture, or let's say other things that you use, you can name those accounts too. And we said that for every debit entry, there's a credit entry. You can't debit, there's going to be an error. Okay, all right. So, and we also learn about how to post um, in the and how to post in our journal and then how to post in our leisure as well. Okay, so today we are going to learn of, about chart of account. Chart of account. Chart of account is not any scary thing. When you understand what a general ledger means, basically, as I said yesterday, with the general ledger, it is information you are getting from your journal. So based on the, the first point is the transaction that you record. The second step is the journal entries, where you enter them. Now, when you are done with the journal entry, you need to create accounts for each of the um, journals that you created. Okay, so as I've always been using cash and let's say furniture, when you are done, you need to go and create an account. You need to have a ledger book. So what I can do is that you can't mix all these things. You can decide to keep one book for only transactions, one book for journal entries, and one book for a ledger. So that if you need any information in your ledger, you can quickly refer to your ledger. If you're also using a computer, you can create an Excel sheet and you name the individual sheet. So one sheet for transactions, one sheet for all journal entries, and one sheet for a ledger. Okay, so I'll try and prepare one. I'll try and prepare an example and then probably share with you maybe tomorrow during the class how it's going to look like. That's if you're using an Excel sheet so that you can all have a fair idea. All right. Yes, so the chart of account that I'm saying, after you've created an account in your general ledger, for all the journal entries, then those accounts that you have, you turn them as chart of accounts. Okay, so basically we are getting our chart of accounts from our leisure account. So it means that any form of transaction that we have in our organization is going to form an account for us and that account automatically becomes our chart of account. So that's how we define a chart of account, a listing of the names of the accounts that a company has identified and made available for recording transaction in its general ledger. Okay, so let's move on here. Now, 
someone will ask, why do I need a chart of account? So that you know the number of accounts or the type of accounts that you deal with. Mind you, every startup might not have the same chart of account. Maybe you are into online training. Maybe you are into um, buying and selling. We are all having different kind of startups or one day we might have different kind of startups. Let's have it in mind that my startup account might be different from your startup account. Uh -huh. So if you are, let's say, selling items, it will really be different from someone rendering a service. So if you produce items, your chart of account might not be the same as someone rendering a service. So if I'm running a service, there's no way I'm going to get inventory because I don't produce items. But if I produce items, if I sell items, I produce items and I sell them. I'm dealing with uh -huh. But if I render a service, there's no way I'm going to get an inventory account. That's why I'm saying that our chart of accounts starts from the kind of transactions that we engage in in our various business or startups. Yes, please, I hope at this point we all understand. And for you to get a well structured chart of accounts, probably you should also create an under sheet for all chart of accounts. So this one is going to be easy. You just go to your ledger and then you list all the chart of accounts. So when you see cash, so cash is part, inventory is part, receivables is part, tools and equipment, telephone expenses, electricity, rent expense, printing and stationery. Assume that you have all these kind of transactions in your organization, then yes, of course, they are going to be your chart of account. And we always have to number our chart of account. We can't just leave them like that. When we, as we go further into these studies, we are going to learn about some accounting softwares, okay? And then some of us might not even need to do this bookkeeping manually. We'll have to do them using the accounting software. And I'm going to teach you how to use the various accounting softwares. Automatically, in an accounting software, you are going, the, the system is going to generate a chart of accounts for you based on the kind of transaction that you enter into your account, your system. Uh -huh. And then it numbers them for you so that anytime you're looking for a particular sort of account, you can easily enter the number. So for instance, you want to, I'm looking for a particular sort of account, you want to enter some transactions in the, let's say rent. Rent will have an ideal number, let's say 010. So anytime you see zero or you enter 010 in your system, it takes you to the rent account, then you can easily enter in your transactions. Okay, that's one way of, that's an easy way of using accounting software because the software makes things easy for you instead of doing all these things manually. So for some time now, as we've been starting the class, all that we've been doing is sort of manual. But then as we go further, I'm going to introduce to you some accounting software that can help our startups. So when we um, have access to these softwares, we can actually have a very simple bookkeeping. It's going to make our work very, very, very simple. And I'm going to enjoy bookkeeping. Okay, so I believe at this point, we all know chart of accounts. It is basically the accounts that we recorded in our general ledger. We put them together. We summarize all of them. Then we have our own chart of accounts. I'm going to share an example of a chart of account over here. So for instance, this is someone's chart of account. When we go to assets, it has been numbered. One zero one is cash. One two zero is accounts receivable. When we say accounts receivable, these are money that our customers owe us or other people owe us. That's accounts receivable. One four zero is what inventory. Okay, we saw items. So the stock that we have available, that's our inventory. Then we have land and buildings. That's an asset. And we have equipment. So anytime you and there's a, a transaction relating to equipment. You just go to your chart of account, number 174, and then you make the entries in there. That's when you're using a software. But it's ideal that even if you're not using a software and you're, using, you're doing bookkeeping manually, it is ideal that we always keep our chart of account. Then we categorize them nicely. Yesterday, I stated that we can have over thousands of accounts based on the number of transactions that we do in our organizations. But at the end of the day, every transaction or every account must fall under the five main types, the five main accounts. We have five main accounts, that's the assets, the liability, owner's equity, 
revenue and expense. So out of all the accounts that we have registered or entered in our journal, um, in our journal we need to categorize them under the five main accounts. So there's someone's chart of accounts. Okay, so under assets, these are the kind of accounts the person is dealing with. So it means that when I go to the person's general ledger, I need to see cash, I need to see accounts receivable, I need to see inventory, I need to see land and building, I need to see equipment. The reason for doing all these things is that it helps us to prepare our financial statement because in our statement, we're not going to list all the accounts that we have, we need to categorize them. That's why we have five main accounts that we categorize these other sub accounts into. Okay, good. When we come to liability, it means money that we owe people. We can owe our workers, people that work for us, and we can also owe our suppliers, that's our creditors. Our creditors fall under our accounts payable. Then we number it. The reason for numbering is that it makes our work very, very organized. So anytime I'm looking for an account, I, I, there's this the number. Okay, so what we can do is that when we create the ledger, then we give them the numbers. So when I create my ledger, when I create a very big sheet, which entails my ledger accounts, then I know that 101 is cash. One two zero. So when I see one two zero, I I know that everything under one two zero is for accounts receivable, and it makes things organized. They are looking for transactions. Are looking for details. In the moment you look you look out for these numbers, it helps you to know the kind of account you've and the kind of account you have your transactions in. Okay. Then we have our owner's equity. So if it's a sole proprietorship, it's your own business. Sometimes the owner can take money from the business funds and then not to spend or not, but then you, when you spend, you don't even need to reimburse the company. That's why it's best that you don't mix your personal money with the company's money. And then our revenue, and we have our expenses. So this is just an example of a chart of accounts. Based on the assignment I gave to you yesterday, when we draw up our leisure account, we will automatically get our chart of account very easily. And then I'll give you an assignment on that. But then based on what you bring to me, I will assist you. So if you prepare, when you're able to submit your assignment, then I can also assist you in preparing your chart of account. So I will make your work very easy for you. All right. So um, this is another example of a chart of account. It, it differs, as I said. It depends on the kind of business that you are into. It will differ. So if you can't go to someone um, who's into products and you, you are into um, running of services and then copy the same your chart of account right from the kind of transactions that you are dealing with. Okay, so right now we are done with another tool of the bookkeeping. So we now know general entries. We now know the general ledger. And we now know our chart of our account. Then the last but one tool of bookkeeping is the trial balance. It is a trial balance. It is a trial balance. What is a trial balance? A trial balance is a list of closing balances of leisure accounts on a certain date. And is the first step towards the preparation of financial statements. All right. As I said yesterday, with your leisure account, we take every information from our journal, okay? So once we enter every transaction in our journal, automatically we go and post them in our leisure account. We go and post them in our leisure account. Great. So at the end of the week, it depends on when we really want to have our reporting, but I'll suggest that it is done monthly so that it doesn't confuse you. So you can create your leisure accounts monthly, or you can have a monthly records of everything. So at the end of the month, you need to close your account. Then you start again, okay, uh-huh. Then when we are done, finally, finally, at the end of the year, we have our closing balance for the year. But for now, when we start on a monthly basis, it will help us so that things will be smooth for us. But if we pile up everything and we wait till the end of the year, things might become bursome. So let's assume that we have our leisure account and we now want to prepare a travel balance at the end of the month. We go to every single account in the leisure account. So 
as I said, we, we will go to cash. We will go and sum up all the debits in cash, all the credits in cash. We go to, then we look out for the difference. The difference is what we take to the trial balance. Then we go to another account. It can be rent. And then we close the account, all the debits, all the credits. Some of, some of the, for instance, things like expenses, it will be hardly for you to get credit because for every expense, you will debit to the account because that particular expense item is receiving. So if you are paying electricity bills, your cash is going out and your electricity is receiving the cash. Uh -huh. So for most of the expenses, your account is going to be a debit account. So at the end of the month, you close all your accounts. So you close the ledger account, you close your cash, you close every single account that you have in your ledger, you close it. And then when you are done, you just take them, you prepare a trial balance. And I'm going to see how, we'll see how a trial balance looks like. And I'm going to take you through the trial balance. Okay. So a trial balance ensures that the debit balance and the credit balance in the ledger should match. If not, there may be some one or two errors. So if at the end of the month, your trial balance is not balancing, then there's an error. Your credit balance should be able to match your debit balance when you are done and then also you should have the following columns in your trial balance you should have assets and let's remember that all assets all assets have a debit balance all liabilities have a credit balance all if so at the end of the day in your trial balance anything classified as an asset must have a debit balance anything classified as a liability must have a credit balance anything classified as an expense and you know our expenses utilities wages rent print station any form of expenses that we incur in our business as we render services as we produce goods any services that we incur must always have a debit balance the owner's equity the kind the money that we invest into the business must have a credit balance and always our revenues must have a credit balance. When we know all these things and prepare the trial balance, it will help you so that when you realize that you have gone to put cash, you've gone to put cash as a credit balance, then it's wrong because cash is an asset. So definitely it, it needs to have debit balance so let's all remember so in actual liabilities must have a credit balance and then all your expenses must have a debit balance likewise your equity your owner's equity that's the money that you've invested into the business and then your revenue all these must have a credit balance now let's look at an example of a child balance i'm going to take them one after the other this is someone's child balance this child balance was taken from the general ledger so in the general ledger the person had an account for land and buildings, had an account for furniture and fittings, had an account for machinery and equipment, had an account for inventory, had an account for debtors control. That's the same as accounts receivable. That's money that you're receiving from your debtors. The person also had a bank account, not a bank account that's the one in the bank, no. The person also had a capital account. The person also had a loan account. Maybe he took a loan from a bank. Creditors control, money that you owe your supplier. Sometimes we get our goods on credit basis from our suppliers. We have sales accounts, we have sales retained. Sometimes the goods that we sell to people, they return the goods back to us. Uh -huh. Because of some one or two issues that might come. It depends on the kind of principles that you have in organizations. Some organizations might not accept the sales or sometimes to um people work on commission for you okay so things back so the cost that we incurred in putting our product together that's the cost of good sales advertising expenses membership fees probably you are part of a group and you pay membership fees water and electricity telephone salaries and wages interest paid so all these so all these things are we can say are accounts in the person's general ledger and these are the kind of transactions that a person engages in please i believe we all understand 
someone, someone can just respond on your behalf so that I can know that you all understand what is happening. Okay. I believe we can go on. Okay, so I have two raised hands. Okay, Elizabeth. Okay, I think we can go on. All right. So now we take this you, know, you understand? Yes, please. All right. Thank you very much. Now let's move on. Okay. So now let's look at the trial balance. Someone has raised his hand. Let me see. Okay, Cephas. Hello. Hello. I just want to understand what you're saying. All right. Okay, thank you. Then I believe I can move on. Okay. Okay, so as I was saying, this, these um, details were taken from the person's leisure general ledger so in the general ledger these are the various accounts that can be seen in the person's general ledger so as i said at the for if you want to prepare a trial balance it is when you sum up when you close the account so when we go to land and buildings the person probably purchased a land maybe the person tries to build for the company or something okay so the person purchased land and that's for the company so as the person purchased land, the land and builders account will be debited and either our bank or cash will be credited because money is going out and we are receiving something of that the land and then the buildings. So at the end of the month, if we are closing our account, these are the, these are the sums that we, we got as a closing the account. So land and buildings is 110. Furniture and fittings at the end of, and let's always remember, as I said, Assets have the debit balance. So as you can see, all the assets, land and building, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The first six are all assets and they all have a debit balance. When we go to capital, capital can be likened to owner's equity. And we said it has a credit balance. It has a credit balance. So if in your trial balance, we see that capital is a debit, mm, then there's an error. It's going to affect you. So always need to remember what I said about the five main columns and where each, and where each balance lies or which the kind of balance they have, whether a debit or credit. So the, the first, the five accounts, two of them are debit, three of them are credit. You can remember that and assets and expenses are debit. The remaining are credit. I think using this kind of um, scenario will help us understand. All right. So that's just by the way, that is the trial balance that we have. It will always come from, I can see some raised hands. Okay, Esther, please, you have a question. Okay, I think we can go on. Okay, I think we can go on. All right, so that, that's just the, that's the trial balance. So always remember that we get the trial balance from our general ledger. Okay, great. So we are done with the third two of bookkeeping. So we now know general entry. We now know posting into ledger account. We now know chart of account. We now know trial balance. So that's four. We are going to the last one. We consign our bank statement. Probably not every one of us has registered the company as a, a corporation. Okay, probably it might be a sole proprietorship. Even that, if you have to keep your person. Okay, all right. Please, who has a question? Yeah, me. Please, um, I'm listening. With the asset, I don't get why asset should have a debit balance because I was thinking with asset is something that you have. So if you have it, it should be credit, not debit. Debit is when you're taking something out of the account. No, don't get it wrong. Okay, that them all assets generally 
have a debit account, okay? And if your assets have a credit account, then you know there's a reduction in your asset balance. So for instance, let's take cash, okay? Cash is an asset. So all assets, you owe the asset, they belong to you, so they are assets. Please, you understand? Or you still don't get it? Okay, yeah, okay. Let's move on. Okay, okay, so move on. But if you don't understand anything, you can just prompt my attention. I'll take it through. Okay, so but then let's always remember these um, five things that our assets have a debit balance. At the end of the day, that's what I'm saying that when you are preparing your trial balance, this is the final thing, okay? But you know we have cash and you can credit your cash. That is when there's a transaction. But this particular thing is, is referring to when you have totally closed your account and you prepare your trial balance, okay? So if you are going to enter a transaction in your journal, let's say you bought something, definitely your cash will be credited because yeah, money is going out. A particular account is going to receive. But for this particular things, these five things I have stated here, they are for when you've closed your account, you have closed the ledger account, you have at the end of the month, you are now going to you are now sitting down to prepare your report, a debit balance, and all liabilities must must have a credit balance. Uh -huh. So these ones refer to when you are closing the account, not when transaction is going on. Because when transaction is going on, transactions happen. You can receive money, money will go out. But when you are done with everything, you're closing your account, always remember that your assets have a debit balance, your liabilities have a credit balance, your expenses debit, owner's equity or capital credit, and then your revenue credit. All right. If you're going to bank statement, and as I said, let's try to separate our personal bank account from our companies or our startups bank accounts let's try and create op open accounts for our businesses because if we add them to our personal bank um, account it's going to create a whole lot of mess because you also have needs okay and you also go and withdraw for your own personal needs so if from the same bank account yeah, people are paying you, suppliers are paying you huge sums of money and also withdrawing from the same amount to spend. It, it wouldn't really help reporting. For that day, you might go and spend the company's money and you might be incurring losses you wouldn't understand. No, no, you are spending the money and it won't be deliberate that oh, I want to spend my company's money. No, that's because the account is together. So let's always try. In as much as the business might be small, let's try to separate the account. Even if you can't open an account, let's say a company account for your business. What you can do is that you can create two different accounts. So one will be solely for your business and one will be solely for your personal items. So you can have two bank accounts, maybe, or you can even have in the same bank, you can have two different accounts and one will be for your business, one will be for your personal needs so that you don't always mix them. Uh -huh. So we want to reconcile our statements Every time at the end of the month, we need to reconcile our bank statements. When we take our statement from the bank and we take our cash book, we need to balance it. Our cash book, as we learned, is also an account in the general ledger. Okay, and we know that in the general ledger, we have so many accounts. So this time around, with the bank statement, we are focusing it only on the cash because the, the cash, the bank and cash are interrelated. We take money from the bank and then we use it for our operations. Okay, right. So that's how come we always need to reconcile our cash account with the bank account and not reconcile our bank account with the whole general ledger. No, even if you want to go and purchase something, it is done using cash or it's done using bank. So it's ideal that you always reconcile your bank account and then your cash book. All right, so your bank statement. It is very, very simple. I'm going to give you about four steps in reconciling it. It might look quite cumbersome. It might look cumbersome, but when I'm done, I'll show you a template and then I invest you compile these things into probably a word form 
so that I can share it. So that when you go back and you are working on it, or you are going over, you can probably remember some of the steps. Because as I teach, maybe I might not get the time to write everything. So I'll try my best to compile them. But um, we might get this after the class because my fear is that if I compile them and I bring them, it might prevent people from joining the class. So I, I have a Word document. I have it ready. But my, and it's everything is together right from the beginning of the class to the end. So if I share it right now, it will affect the attendance. And we also need our certificates. So it's important that we are punctual for class. Okay, so please, let's move on. At this point, do you have, okay, Elizabeth has raised your hand. Yeah, um, actually, what I wanted to say is, since, okay. like, you are thinking about the attendance or something like that, why don't you rather make, like, maybe a small note on what you teach on this day, so that when you are done and people are not able to attend, that very small note, they can be able to know what you thought that day. You get it. Not necessarily okay. means, like, everything or something everything. like that. Okay, okay. All right. That's a good point. So, I'll, I'll look at that, too. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Someone has also raised their hand. Who is, who, okay, so let me check the person. Um, Jeff, who? Uh, but as Elizabeth said, I think she's right. Maybe based on what we actually learned that day, I just put it on the page and then it will just be for that day. Then if there are any assignments, you can look on them to assist you. So it means that right now I owe you about four notes. Yes. No, today's the third day, so I owe you about three notes. Okay. All right. Someone wants to talk? Oh, it's fine. Okay, let's move on. We are almost done, though. Okay, so as I said, it's important that we always reconcile our bank statements with the cash account. And let's remember please always request for your bank statement from the bank some banks might give your bank statement to you at the end of every month some bank give it to you okay so always ensure that at the end of the month you are requesting for your bank statement at the end of the month you are requesting for your bank statement Okay, so let's look at the steps involved in reconciling our bank statements. First of all, we need to take our bank statements. When we get the bank statement, then we take our cash book. This time we are looking at only the cash book. It's only the cash book we are interested in because that's the account which deals directly with the bank statement. So when we take our bank statement, first of all, we need to compare deposits. We need to compare the deposits. And let's remember, as I said yesterday, Anita mentioned, she asked the question about the debit and credit of our bank as being different from accounting. And I explained that, yes. When you go to the bank, okay, and you take your statement, so the credit side is again to you, the individual, or you, the account holder. And the debit side shows the money have left the account but our cash book that we have prepared it is quite different okay when we come to our cash book all the debits are showing money that we have received okay and then the credit is showing money that have left the company so right now, let's say a supplier comes to you and pays you, a customer comes, sorry, and pays you money for goods provided or for services rendered. When the customer leaves, and let's say you've entered the transaction, you've done your general entry. Now, when you're entering from the general to the ledger, definitely you have debited your cash account because you have received money from your customer. You sold goods, you rendered services, so you received money. Now, when you're Taking this money to the bank, that's per the accounting rule, accounting rule. But when you go to the bank and they are entering it into your system for you, when you get a statement, all the money that you put in the bank, all the deposits will reflect at the credit side. Uh -huh. So with this kind of comparison, when you take your um, 
bank statement, you compare the credit side of your bank statement to the debit side of your cash book. Please, I believe we understand. Don't then compare debit of your bank to debit of your car and that you will be frustrated. You feel that, hey, where from all these monies? I've not seen all these monies. No, please. When you take your bank statement, the credit side refers to all the monies you have received. So always start comparing. When you start the comparison, always compare first. The credit side, all the credit side, you want to see, okay, at the end of the month, per my cash book, I received 10,000 CDs. Now let's go to the bank. Per the bank, okay, there was a credit of 1,000, credit of 200, credit of 300, credit of, at the end of the month, all your credits, the credit that you received, that you got from the bank, from the bank side, it should be able to tally with your debit side. If it doesn't tally, then there is an error. You need to correct that. You need to find out where that error is coming from. So that's the comparing of deposits. Sometimes your customers pay directly to the bank. Okay, you give them bank details. Oh, pay, I don't accept cash. I once work with a company. They are not accepting cash at the office. They always use the bank. So what they do is that when you go to the bank and you go and pay, then you bring a deposit slip to the office. Then we record it in our cash book. I believe we understand. So that every time your cash book is updated, even if you don't receive cash at the office and you tell them to pay at the bank directly, tell them to always, to, because you need to issue them receipts, right? Very good. Before you issue them receipts, you need to tell them to bring a slip, a deposit slip of a deposit they made. And when they bring it, you now enter it into your debit side of your cash book. Uh -huh. So that's where they're comparing deposits. So I know that's okay. At the end of the month, per my cash book, I received 10000 So, and unless, of course, the money that you received, you spent some. Maybe you didn't bank everything at the bank. Okay. So, for instance, sometimes you can receive money from a customer. And from the same money you spend. Okay. So, in that sense, there can be discrepancies. Okay. But uh, they always make sure that you bank your money. You don't spend from the money that you receive. Okay, so if you receive revenues, don't spend from it. Every time, go and bank it. Uh -huh. So you can, this, these comparisons can be very easy. But if every time you get money and then you spend from that particular money, it might affect you. Understand some businesses might be very small, so you might not really have the luxury of putting the money in the bank and then waiting for, and then using other money from somewhere. So what you can do is that, to ensure that you are keeping good records of everything that's happening in the organization. When you receive money, you can look for days in which you bank all monies. It can be maybe Mondays or let's say Fridays. Then you bank everything. Then when you are going to take money from the bank, you know that, okay, I took money from this account. Then you can easily reconcile your account. But if you are taking money and spending from that money, you reconcile the bank statement might be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is that you adjust the bank statement. Right now, we have compared the deposits. We are okay. Our debit balance in our cash book is matching with the credit in our bank, in our bank statement. So we are okay. But some, when we are done with it, now we put everything down. Then we pick only the bank statement. Then now that we are comparison, now I'm going to take them one after the other. We will pick the bank statement and adjust it and we'll pick our cash book and adjust it when we finish then we put them together so that we can ensure that our bank statements the balance at the bank statement is the same thing as the balance in our cash book all right so with the adjusting of the bank statement i adjust the balance on the bank statement to the corrected balance in doing this you need to add deposits in transit deduct outstanding checks or bank errors. Okay, so this might be a lot, but I have a template that's down there that shows what you have to do. I'll add it to the um, document I'm going to send you. So when you are there, you can actually sit down and then go over it. You might understand it better. Okay, so when you pick your bank statement, let's remember that sometimes your clients might come and pay you and they might issue a check. Maybe they issue the check to you 31st March and as the time that you were checking with your 
bank balance, that money had not reflected. Okay, so you need to adjust your, but then your cash before you entered it, so that you see money from a client, the person paid by check. But when you check a bank statement, it hasn't reflected because it's in transit. And sometimes um, checks from different banks take between one to two days, and from the same bank, it takes the same day. So assuming that your client paid you using a different bank, and the person paid you on 31st March, Meanwhile, the bank, and you also, you also need your statement as a 31st March. So you go in for a bank statement from the bank. When you get a bank statement, you will not see the check that your client gives you because it hasn't reflected yet. We term that check as a deposit in transit because it hasn't yet reached or hit your account. So that could be a difference between your cash book and then your bank balance. So you adjust it, okay, you adjust it. And then also we have some bank, or some, sometimes the bank also makes errors. So you need to go through the bank statement and see every single transaction. If the bank is charging you for, let's say, the bank will charge you for the services they rendered. They can charge you for e-bank, let's say internet banking. They can charge you for checkbooks. They can't, okay. So you need to go through all those things in your bank statement and know that you have not been charged twice. Some makes an error they will charge you instead of maybe like twice so that's a bank adjustment uh -huh. so that's with the bank statement adjusting the bank statement so the first step you compare the deposit between the bank statement and your card book when you are done you pick only your bank statements and then you adjust them you look through your bank okay is there any deposit in transit is there any outstanding check that you need to give out sometimes you've written a check to someone the person it hasn't yet been debited from your account okay you've written a check but the person hasn't received the money hasn't been taken from your account yet to pay the person because of maybe different banks or something all these are examples of adjustment that needs to be so remember deposit in transit maybe a client depositing money to you because at that time it hasn't reflected yet you too on your part you can issue a check to someone maybe you issued a check 30th march and you also you went for a bank statement 31st march it might not have reflected because of the different banking because of the different banks that both of you use it will take time before your account is cleared of that amount so you need to but because you've already listed all these things in your cash book it will help you to adjust your bank balance so you know the original balance there because sometimes your balance can be less your balance can be five thousand in your bank account but what if you've already signed a check of two thousand so ideally your account should be three thousand but you are seeing five thousand because of what the outstanding check that has not yet been cleared so when we take our bank statement and we go through all these things and we look at we, we look at all the and the puts in transit and then the outstanding checks we will be able to identify some of these things and then adjust our bank statement accordingly we can't always believe the balance at the end of the month because there may be some entries or some clearances that have not yet been made so when you take your bank statement you adjust them so that if there are any clearances you adjust them before and you can know that okay as it stands on this is the money that i have in my bank in my account the bank doesn't have the same thing because it hasn't cleared the account yet uh -huh. then the third step is that right now we are now adjusting all the things in our bank balance we need to adjust our cash account we now come to our cash account and we adjust it are there any monthly charges that we need to probably go and pay is there an overdraft fees so you need to adjust so when you take your cash Maybe you're supposed to pay something of the month. You haven't paid it. So when you pay, this is the money you're going to um, get in your account. I believe you understand. Okay. So let's say at the end of the month, our cash book is saying that we have a debit of 3,000 cities in our cash book, but we haven't taken some monthly deductions or charges out yet. We need to take those things out because whatever we do will be deducted from these charges, assuming that you have an insurance policy that you pay. In your cash book, you have to adjust it. If you don't adjust it and you assume that, okay, my cash balance asset that first match is 3,000 and you don't adjust or deduct any monthly charges from it, when it's been deducted, you wonder where the money went to and you, you, you think that, oh, money has left your 
cash balance or cash left or cash without you knowing about it no so at the end of the month if there are any monthly charges that you always pay check them out so you can see the original balance that is left so that's adjusting your cash account so as you did for the bank you adjust your bank balance take into consideration all checks that have not been cleared and then you adjust them accordingly and then when it comes to your cash book too you adjust it based on the deductions or monthly deductions that should have taken place that have not yet been taking place so that's the third step and then we go to the last step the last step is now to compare the balances right now at first we compared only deposits and then later on we adjusted our bank balance to suit what it stands now based on example deposits in transit the bank deductions then outstanding checks we've done that now we come to our cash book we adjust it based on the current situation. We've taken out monthly deductions. We've taken out any expense that we need to take us at the end of the month. Now we know the original money that's left, okay? So when we are done with adjusting all these books, then we now compare the balances. At the end of your reconciliation, your bank balance must be the same thing as your cash book balance. If it's not the same thing, they need to go over this process again, unfortunately, in order to get a reconciled amount. I remember about two months ago, we were reconciling our statements at work. My colleague was, was in charge of that. He reconciled and reconciled and reconciled. It wasn't balanced, but the, the thing has to balance. So reconciliation, your bank reconciliation has to balance because you need to file them probably as a company like ours. Because of auditing and all that, we need to file our bank records. When auditors and um, you ask for your, all the bank reconciliations at the end of every month. That's what I'm saying that it's important that you always reconcile your bank accounts because if you have auditors coming in at your company, they'll always request for your reconciliation. And the, why is it reconciliation when it's not balancing? So we tried and we tried and we're able to figure out the differences. The, the issue was that there were some uncleared checks. We had issued checks to people and then we had not factored it in our adjustments. That's how come our, our bank um, and cash book wasn't balancing. Uh -huh. So we had to um, correct that error and we were able to balance our cash book and then our bank balance. So at the end, no matter the kind of transaction that you run, at the end of the month, your cash book, because your cash book, it says everything about what's in your bank. So why is it not balancing? Unless, of course, there are some unclear checks. So when you make those adjustments, when you correct those things, then you are able to balance them. So finally, the fourth step, you compare all your balances. So I hope you remember these four steps. First of all, compare all your deposits. And remember that your cash book has a debit balance. Okay, any money that you received will be your debit balance in your cash book. in your bank will be a credit balance uh -huh. and then also you adjust your bank statement you consider all deposits in transit or on clear checks or bank charges then you come to your cash book all monthly charges or interest i need to pay anything i need to pay on the month that you haven't adjusted it you adjust it when you are done you compare your balances and it should be the same so this is an example of a bank reconciliation formula Okay, so balance as per the bank's books is there. Then there is the bank reconciliation. Then all unpresented checks, so that is, it can be deposit, it can be um, all unclear checks. Okay, so checks that have unpresented checks, checks that you haven't presented yet, you add them because they are coming to you. A client has paid you um, money. They issued checks to you, but you haven't taken the check to the bank yet. The check is with you. You need to add it because you need to know. The, assuming you are taking the bank, we have changed your bank balance. Uh -huh. Because you're not taking it to the bank, that's how come it's just... You need to add it. And then any other credit direct... Bank sometimes to then we take away the yet those monies have not been received. So
to a client has signed a check for you. You've not received that money yet, or a check a client did a bank transfer from his or her bank to your bank. Once you don't receive the money yet, you can't add it to your money. So that one is taken out. And any dishonest check, sometimes checks bounce, unfortunately, okay, some because of insufficient funds, or sometimes there might be issues with your dates. Uh -huh. I also remember a time we issued checks. You can we and you know, checks um take six months before they expire. Uh -huh. But unfortunately, we wrote 2019 on our check. So when the person took the um, check to their bank, the person could not withdraw because it was 2019 February and when 2020 February, that's one year. Uh -huh. So it was a dishonest check. So in our bank reconciliation, we can't add that. We need to take that off and other items. So at the end of the day, always remember, your cash book account must always balance your um, bank statement. That's why it's important that you don't mix your personal account with your business account. So when you're withdrawing money, it's easy. You can be able to monitor it very, very, very well. So we are done with today's class. So today, I believe we've learned a lot of things. We just continue with about three tools of bookkeeping. We learned about chart of account, and we said that the chart of account, we take all those accounts in a general ledger, and we put them together, we number them, we categorize them into assets, into liabilities, into expenses, into revenues. Uh -huh. Then we are done, we have a trial balance. If we really want to prepare as a financial statement, we need a trial balance. And that is the closing amount at the end of every ledger account. So we take the closing balance as cash, closing balance as reven at revenue, closing balance as equipment, closing balance as debtors, closing balance at the payables accounts. We bring them all together to form a trial balance. And we said that in our trial balance, all assets have a debit and M, have a debit balance, and all expenses have a debit balance. The remaining three, that's equity or let's say capital, and owner's capital, revenue, and then liabilities. They all have credit balances in our trial balance. And we went ahead to also look at what bank reconciliation. It's important that we always perform bank reconciliation. So I'll be happy if you could take time, probably go and take one month. Maybe you not started, you don't really have a structured cash book, but let's use the month of April, okay? At the end of the month of April, let's request for our bank statements. Let's take our cash book and let's try to reconcile them. If it's not balancing, Let's consider the kind of factors that we have. It can be unclear checks, maybe some errors at the bank. So you adjust all your statements and then you can be able to have a reconciled statement. As you rightly said, I'm going to try as well to share what we've done so far with you so that some of the steps like this, you can always remember them. So that when you're going back to reconcile your books, you can follow these steps. Please, is there any questions? Is anyone having any questions? Please, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Yes, uh, yes, please. Um, okay. I think it's not a question directly related to this, but then I we mm -hmm. sent a suggestion that it's like you've not seen it. Oh, you sent a might... suggestion. Yes. Okay. Is it concerning the um the Isn't document that... I sent you after class? No, no, no. it's concerning the double, in, the double okay, entry. Okay, okay, I'm Sent listening. It's in the chat, um, uh, what do you call it, window. So perhaps, because it's like most of us are a bit confused because uh, for those of us who are not coming from, uh, you know, okay. haven't had it, you know, from the okay. layman's point of view, we only know it to be one entry procedure, but then okay. now we have been introduced um, Double entry. Early. So we kind of a bit of if you could um, at the end of this just a quick summary. A double entry procedure will be very very beautiful. Okay, okay, all right. So let me go over the double entry again. Exactly. So, okay, so every transaction, okay, there are, um for every transaction there are two entries. That's what we need to remember first and foremost. Okay, for always remember for every transaction. There are two entries. So we can give you an example. Let me give you an example. I always use this example. 
we are going to pay our rent. Okay, let's say in your transaction record. Okay, so rent means that two things are involved here. How did you pay the rent? Do you use cash? Of course, either you use cash or you use check. Okay, so let's say you use cash. Now you are going to create two accounts from this transaction. The cash account, that's how, where the money left. And then the rent, where the money went to. Okay, so that's how come we have two accounts over here. That's how come we have the double entry. So because we have to identify two accounts here, what do we need to do? We always say that what? You debit your receiver and you credit the giver. Who was the giver? The company was the giver. The cash. It was our cash. So we will credit our cash. Then who received the money? Rent received the money. So we will debit our rent. Meanwhile, you might think it's just one transaction. Okay, we're paying rent. That's all. Cash going out. That's all. We paid rent. That's all. No. It has to be two. So for any transaction, try and identify two accounts in there. Please, Abdelai, do you understand or you still are confused? Um, Pardon? Oh, I can't hear you. Uh -huh. I said, uh, so if, yeah, I'm now getting Okay, okay. So always remember for any transaction that you have in your company, the accounts that are going to um, draw from it might either be two or even three. For instance, you took cash, all right, but you paid for about four things. So that is like five accounts. So let's say you took cash, you paid electricity, you paid staff, you bought stationery for the company. These are three things. So cash account, that's the credit one. And those receiving uh, your staff receiving your money, electricity receiving, and stationery receiving. So you're going to debit all those who receive their money. So staff, electricity, stationery, they all received. So those are what debit entries because they are receiving. And then the credit, the cash is going out. So how many accounts have we generated here? About four accounts. Uh -huh. So for every transaction, that's why I said the first step is what? analyze the transaction. When you analyze the transaction, and then you identify the account in there. Then when you take, when you analyze the transaction, always remember, the receiver is debited and the giver is credited. Uh -huh. That is, any more questions? Any more questions? Any? Please, I hope you are on the assignment. I hope everyone is on the assignment. We are all having the assignment and then yeah, if you have any issue, kindly reach out to me. I'm available. Okay. I'm more than willing to assist every single person here because we are all learning. We are all learning. Okay. All right. So that's about today. So I'm going to compile what we did from Monday through to today. Then I'm going to share, as I've promised, I have to share it with you. I'm going to share it with you. Okay, uh -huh. if I do it that way, it will be better so that when you go over your revising and uh, probably doing the assignment, it will help you. Okay, so that's the end of the class. Thank you so much for making it a point to come to class. Okay, I'm excited you are all here. So, and trust you me, we are going to go through this thing together. You're going to understand the basis of accounting because it's important that as startups, as businesses, we are going to expand one day. So we need to inculcate that habit of accounting right now so that when we get to that stage where our companies are big, we don't have issues with bookkeeping at all. Okay, so luckily for today, we didn't have any internet issues. So maybe we will discuss on the page if we should try the eight to nine or tomorrow or we should still go by this. Uh -huh. So we'll discuss on the page and then please, everyone here should give your feedback because it concerns you. All right, so thank you very much and have a lovely day. And as I said, I'm going to send the documents to you right from lecture one to lecture three so I can help you. Okay, so take good care and have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Um, please, when is the last submission for the assignment? Or anytime you want to, then you oh, just. Please. Oh, I, okay, so from now to Friday, Friday is the last day because I have another assignment. It's a build up on this. Uh huh. Okay. So Friday, Friday after. By 12 noon, we should submit the assignment so I can also give the second assignment. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.